You're listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Get the knowledge you need to advance your mortgage practice quickly and efficiently from Jen Duplessis, America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor with over 37 years of experience and over $1 billion in lifetime funding. Jen has been mentoring loan officers and realtors for over 15 years and speaking on stages across the globe. So settle in and get ready as Jen and her guests share their experience passion and strategies to help you crack the top producer code to reach new heights in your business. And now here's your host, Jen Duplessis, mortgage mastery mentor and head chick in charge of Kinetic Spark Consulting. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mortgage Lending Mastery. I am so excited for our episode today. You know, a lot of times I bring on real estate investors, uh, you know, commercial, residential, all kinds of opportunities because I want you to understand um, that mortgage lending is not just residential and sort of take those blinders off. Um, real estate is not just residential. I want you to consider taking those blinders off as a real estate agent and be a real estate agent for all kinds of real estate. And I think that this is most important so that you have some type of income or wealth that you're creating for yourself above and beyond your um, current line of work. So that's why we bring this in. I want you to understand, you know, all aspects of lending and real estate. So with that said, our guest today is Wesley Yates. He is a Texas guy. He's coming to us from Texas. You'll hear that in his voice here in just a minute. But most importantly, he is a former, no, you can never form a right. He was in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Ooh, ah, right? Um, and so we want to thank you, first of all, Wesley, for your um, service to our country. Country. It is a big sacrifice that you make and your family makes as well. And, and we know that because I'm originally from Colorado Springs, Colorado, where it's just latent with military people. So we, we definitely understand that. And we have that in our family as well. So we want to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, happy to have this conversation with you. I love the path that everyone is taking, especially, you know, when it comes to multifamily and commercial. And I know you do beyond just multifamily, but let's talk a little bit about, um, I want to know your background here in just a few minutes, but I want to talk about uh, why you felt or feel even today um, that this is such a powerful uh, avenue or path or roadmap for creating wealth in a more, I guess, passive way? Because I know you're active, but there are others that are involved in the syndications that are passive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, with, with that right there, I didn't come from a, a rich background, you know, hard work in blue collar, you know, Marine Corps, all that. And um, so I took advantage of the syndication strategy, um, you know, mainly using other people's money as well as building an experienced team. To, to build my wealth. Now, of course, <laughs> I want to get on the passive side. There is, uh, you know, some minor passive opportunities that, you know, I'm looking into myself, but, um, you know, that's really the, the strategy that I chose to, to accumulate, you know, my portfolio to build my wealth. And, and then as we sell out of those, you know, taking the profits and my plan is to either, you know, invest into something more passive um, so that I can sit back and have, you know, I'm working on something, but I also got other people working for my money too, um, you know, just to build multiple streams of income as well as, you know, uh, growing my equity and leveraging my equity, leveraging my skill set to, to just continue to stack everything on top of each other. So um, yeah, there's a lot of different things that I dabble in now, but yeah. it's because I want to, to do to diversify along while I'm building, you know, a stable wealth portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and I totally get that. I call that mailbox income, yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. I just want to go out to the mailbox, now. although we could call it inbox income now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, so tell us a little bit about your particular practice. You know, you are, uh, you know, in Texas, uh, you've, um, you know, you uh, have a bachelor's degree in a business administration. You have a, a concentration in finance from the University of Texas. And I know that you have a capital investments company. What is your um, specific niche in this realm? 
Yeah, so I started off in a niche. Um, I really did. Um, and where I started to really get my foot in the door, uh, keep in mind, it took me a while. Let me back up to say that. It took me a good 18 months to find my niche. I mean, and I tried with several different teams, several different roles, and then a few different industries. You know, I went from uh, wholesaling to uh, multifamily syndication to hospitality syndication to development of hospitality to back to, you know, to over to being a fund manager. And then finally step back to just doing multifamily syndication and building my own team around me. So it took me a good 18 months before I really even started seeing success and found found my niche. Yeah. Uh, so where I finally found that niche was in very extreme value add uh, apartments. Yeah. Was yeah. My niche that got me into the into the I guess you could say into the uh, the industry here. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of giggling about this because you said you know it just took me a good time at 18 months, right? There are people that are listening to this podcast that have been in the industry for 20, 25, 30 years and still don't have their niche defined, right? So yeah. how important do you feel having because you brought this up, uh how important do you feel it is to have a niche? Oh, it's it's very important. You know, they, they say there's a misconception amongst the millionaire and the true wealthy. And they say, oh, they have like seven sources of income and they're diversifying. But if you really study how they got started, they started off with one niche. Yeah, they started with one niche. They built their they built their cash flow. They built their wealth from one niche. And then from their profits, they diversified. Yeah. So you can't go in seven different directions at the same time. I've tried. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I did too. Uh, I, I get that. Yeah. 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 So a niche is very important and you're not going to be right the first time. If you somehow, if you're like, no, I was right the first time, then congratulations. You're one of the lucky ones. Um, you know, I've been doing this for three years now. And like I said, it took the first half just figuring out what was right. I tried this, I tried that. But once I found that I didn't have to do everything. I didn't have to know everything. I just had to figure out more so back on who am I? What right. am I good at? What is what your I bring? Yes. Yeah. And then what do I bring to the table with that? And then go, okay, this is my, these are my strengths. Yeah. But to so, do what I want to do, you know, you, you're going to have to cover your weaknesses as well. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. You're going to have to. Um, so what do you consider to be your strengths in your particular line of business? Yeah, uh, I'm really strengths, uh, I would say is, you know, of course, I'm really good at the team, the leadership, um, you know, putting together the right, the, the right team for the job. Yeah. Um, and then really leading them through, you know, knowing where you are, knowing where you want to be and building the right path between the two points. Uh, it's not always a straight line. In fact, more times than not, it's never a straight line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's got ups and downs and all arounds. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, that, that's really one of my biggest strengths is I can see the underwriting. I can see the numbers. I pick out potential mistakes. I guess that kind of comes back from my time in the Marine Corps. I mean, that was, you know, Probably a lot of it. You got to see potential. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's not a matter of, of, of if you are going to face problems. It's a matter of when do you have a plan for every potential problem and a plan for everything to go to, to poop in a handbasket and just figure out how do I get out of this alive? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because, you know, uh, in lending and, you know, because you're in the, in it too. I mean, what you find in lending is that, um, you know, there's 80 some or a hundred and a hundred and some different things that can go wrong in a transaction. And it's amazing that I see that people are like, oh, I can't believe my, my client, um, you know, went out and charged $30,000 in credit card to buy furniture. <laughs> and it's like, well, what do you mean you can't believe that? That's you've been around long enough to know that those kinds of problems can happen, right? I can't believe the appraiser came in with the lower value. I can't believe that there is something broken in the house. You know, we have to anticipate these these uh, si situations and problems, you know, and write them down and know that they do come up all the time and be able to have a resolution for them rather than reacting to them. And I think that's what you know, you're really pointing out is anticipation that problems will happen. And I've already identified what they're going to be so that when they come up, I can handle them quickly and efficiently and move on to the next thing. Yep. 
Exactly. And, and and that's a good thing. And then if the more time you spend on the front end planning for, okay, if this ever arises, this is our plan. If this ever arises, this is our plan. That way, when it does happen, you don't have to spend the extra time because time in this industry is, is, is crucial. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, there's, it's, and that's what I cannot stand is, you know, I've fired a few attorneys. I've fired a few CPAs. I've fired a few team members because, Hey, I asked for that like two, three weeks ago. I had one attorney. I inquired him to take care of a matter. I needed a PSA drafted for a deal that I had been awarded. Mm -hmm. Three days later, nothing from him. Emailed him every day, called him every day, nothing. <laughs> you know, by day four, yep. I engaged a new attorney and right. the new attorney, attorney was willing to work through the weekend. So I was like, okay, you're winning some brownie points. Had me my PSA before the, the the original attorney comes back and goes, all right, here's your PSA. Like two days after I got it from the the second attorney, yeah, I was like, you're you're too late. I'm not paying you. You never yeah. let me know you were even working on it. Here's all the emails of me trying to, you know, what's what's the status? But yeah, you you got to be careful whenever you're playing with this because you can lose deals over people taking too time uh, too much time. Yeah, I love that. And I want to I want to come back to the team concept here in a little bit because I think that that is, you know, super powerful and it sounds like you have some nuggets in there on how to um, build your team. It's one of the things that is my bailiwick as well as leadership and building powerful teams around you so that you can go uh, beyond your business. I call it, you know, we all know about working in our business, right? You're working in your business when you start. You then you start working on your business and you have little but you get kind of pulled back in, you hire one person, you kind of get pulled back in a little bit, you're still trying to work on your business, you get pulled back in. And then the the fun starts happening when you can work above your business, right? So in, on, and above your business, and this is where your team is working, everyone's got the same messaging, everyone is, you know, speaking the same language, it's running like a well-oiled machine. But the super, super power is when you can work beyond. So it's in, on, above, and beyond. And that's what you were speaking to when you're talking about the Uber millionaires, et cetera. You know, one of my colleagues, he's on my, he's on my board. I'll, I'm, I've mentioned his name quite frequently, and it's not a name dropping thing, but it's Jeff Hoffman. He's the co-founder of Priceline and Booking.com. And he's the inventor of the kiosk that we all use when we go to the bank for ATM and in the, in the uh, airports. And he's on my board and he's a billionaire. And that's exactly what it's about is the ability to work in it, to understand it, to work on it so that you start building your team to work above it so that you can walk away from your team and you can start playing around with the things that you really want to do in your life. And, and I think that's so powerful. And I love that you brought that up. Um, you know, I thought that was really, really good. So what, what, and so I do want to come back to teams a little bit later on, but um, so for you, Wesley, you know, what is, what makes you different than others? Why would someone want to be involved with the syndication with you over someone else who has a multifamily syndication and has been doing it for X years or whatever the case may be? Yeah. You know, I ask myself that a lot. I still <laughs> ask myself that today because I, I don't know if it's, I'm too humble or it's the imposter syndrome. But, <laughs> yes, you know, I'm, just, have... I'm not that smart. I, I, I'm, I'm not that experienced. Like I'm on teams where I'm the most inexperienced, most youngest yeah. you know, person I'm around. And then everyone turns to me and go, all right, Wes, what are we going to do for this? And it's like, yeah. uh, but, you know, I, I fall back on the leadership thing there. Yeah. So, I mean, with, with me, I think it's, I hate quitting. Mm -hmm. I hate losing. Mm hmm. So, I mean, and just a kind of a funny story, I'll tie it to my first deal, just to give you that example. Very yeah. first deal, had it under contract. It was a 119 unit uh, apartment uh, out in tech, uh, West Texas. And we put together a team. Everyone was, you know, had their part. Everyone was doing that. We were down to needing basically a million and a half raised, a million and a half raised on my first deal. And we had like a week and a half and our capital raiser finally, you know, the, well, one of our co-sponsors that was in charge of the, the capital raising and all that, he kept, Oh yeah, we got this person. Oh yeah, we got that. So finally it came down. So I was like, okay, we're like moving to close. Where's the money? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I gotta, no, no, you've been saying stuff like that for, for months now, weeks now, 
if if I needed you to deposit whatever you got tomorrow, how much could you deposit? Long pause, zero. Mm -hmm. So my wife, I mean, this is a this is a Sunday night, and my wife is packing her suitcase to to take the family on our vacation. It's already been paid for. We're already ready to go going out. And, and your head's not kids. going with you. <laughs> and I'm like, your head is going, oh my God. <laughs> and she's like looking at me like, why aren't you packing? And I'm like, uh, no, I can't go. And okay. she's just like, what? And I'm like, yeah, if, if, if I go and this deal doesn't close and I feel like it was because I was gone, I'm never going to forgive myself. I'm, I mean, the fact that I feel, I would feel like I let my team down, I let the deal down, I let all, you know, I, I couldn't do it. So, and she's like, I'm not happy, but I understand and get it done, you know? So in that week I pulled the, pulled people together and we raised a million and a half dollars on that first deal. And everybody, it was funny because the, a lot of the others, you know, the key principal, the construction manager, some of the asset management team, they had already like, well, that deal's done. That's dead. On to the next. And so when I, I'm like, hey, we're closing, I'm like, okay, we need to get the contractors out there. We need to get, you know, we need to hit this value add. You know, let's let's get everyone out there now. And he's like, he's like, you know, not prepared. I'm like, what's going on? You know, when we were closing this, he goes, he finally admitted, honestly, I I, I didn't think this one was <laughs> you were gonna do it. Wow. So, but and that's an example, like you had a, you had an experienced partner involved in this, you know, and this is one of the things, you know, that, that a lot of us experience is that, Hey, we reach out for partners who have experience and they, they fall short of our expectations. Yes. Yes. Don't believe the hype. I'll say that. Yeah. Don't believe the hype. Don't, yeah. don't just automatically count as someone as a shoe in mm -hmm. just because you see them on a stage. Yeah. Just because you see them on a podcast, just because you see that they've got a book, right? Actually, to your research, I have I have tried to buy some deal uh, some deals from people that are on stages that are very well known and respected in the community, but I'm sitting there doing a lease audit, and I'm sitting here sixty percent of the property I'm going to have to evict. Why? Yeah. Because their previous address literally says a tent, meaning they were homeless. So we started digging into that and the property manager on site wanted to be hired by my property manager that I was hiring to take over the property. So he wanted the leases to look good, you know, filled up, yada, yada. And here yeah, they were. So she, she told us, she admitted, well, the owner told us just to leave all the vacant doors unlocked. And if there's someone in there the next day, AKA what, you know, some would call a squatter. A squatter, uh, yeah. Bring them a lease application and have them fill it out so that we can show that our occupancy is above 90%. Holy Malacca. Well, that's a good, that's a new story. That's a story I haven't heard yet. Yeah. Oh, oh it was my bad. gosh. Just fill it, it up bad. with squatters. Huh. <laughs> that wasn't even oh, the worst of it. That wasn't yeah. even the worst of it. But. Oh my gosh. So now are you guys, are you typically doing uh, buy and holds? Or are you doing buy and sells or does it depend on the situation? Yeah. So I plan on going in with a bridge loan. Mm -hmm. Finishing the renovation, finishing the value add, increasing the net operating income, mm -hmm. overall appreciating the property, and yeah. then cash out refi. Now, most of that goes to, uh, well, actually, in fact, all back of to your investors. Back to the investors. We consider that as a return of member capital so that they don't have to pay taxes on that because I'm just giving right. you some of your money back. Yeah, yeah. But um, then we hold it for an additional three years. So, total, we're, all, we're talking about a five year average hold time. Yeah. Now I will sit there and watch the market. And right now we're actually looking at what DFW has done. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wow, I'm already, you're going into, you know, well, going into year two, not even hitting the end of year one yet. I'm already at my year three, you know, average, uh, average income, you know, basically yeah. the, the average monthly rent. We're hitting our year three quota already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because like, of whoa. the lack of housing. Yeah. Yeah. And prices going up and inflation and stuff. You know, what I love about the strategy that you're doing is to get the original investment back into the hands of your investors as quickly as possible. And then they can hold, right? They could hold or you could give it back to them and then you take more, you take all of the earnings, right? 
um, either, you know, either way, their original investment or whatever. I think that that's a really good strategy. So often with syndications, you know, the hold strategy for investors is three to five years. You know that you're going to make really good money, but your money's tied up. And so it can't rotate into another opportunity mm -hmm. as quickly. So I love that strategy. And I think, uh, you know, there are different types all over the place. Um, and I hear different ones all the time when I'm talking to people and I'm, you know, doing these interviews. Um, you had mentioned, well, so let me ask you this uh, next question is, um, and I, by the way, I write questions as I'm, I'm thinking about them. I don't ever have prepared questions in any of my podcasts. Um, I have a few, few ideas, but um, how, how saturated do you feel the commercial space is becoming? On what side of the table? On the yeah, I well, I would say on the, yeah, on the side of the table of finding deals. You know, especially when you're looking at multifamily, there's a lot of people in multifamily. I do think I'm going to give you my two cents on this. My perspective is that with a lot of buildings through COVID, and I think it was even pre-COVID, a lot of buildings are being, um, you know, they're vacant. They're sitting there vacant. No one's going into work. And I feel that there's going to, and I already know there is some type of a conversion that's happening now with commercial buildings into some type of residential housing, whether it's apartment buildings or a bunch of Airbnbs, because I know we're doing some commercial Airbnbs now. I've heard about that as well. Um, so what is your take on what's happening, you know, in the multifamily specifically, you know, that particular arena in the country? Yeah, so we're not just buying here in Texas. Um, you know, we're buying pretty much nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just multifamily anymore, but to speak to multifamily more more particular to syndication, mm -hmm. where I think the saturation is really taking place is in the actual number of syndicators. Yeah, uh, they're uh, everywhere. Yeah, and, and, and you look at it and it's because being frank, being a manager, mm -hmm. you, you structure these deals to where they're in favor of the investor getting majority of the cash flow. Yeah. Uh, so there's not a lot of cash flow in it for the manager. So a lot of these managers that see that and realize, hey, they they stumbled upon their own strategy. They will start a what I call a guru course. Yeah. They'll call it, you know, an education platform and yeah, then they'll I sell know. that. So, yeah. you know, they get to the point where they're selling that and pushing that more than they're pushing to grow their own platforms or portfolios or they'll leverage their their education course to their students where they're bringing them deals to do that. But I was talking to a gentleman actually outside of a Grant Cardone conference. I was at a family office event and was right next to a, a 10X Cardone. And we got to kind of talking in the, the lobby. It was in uh, Miami. Yeah, but, I was um, there. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> yeah, I was at the Cardone event. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, so anyway, we we're talking and he was a different, you know, he studies the industry, studies the markets, but he had a pool on on it and he's like I've been he was kind of going through all the numbers uh and he said the the number of syndicators alone is going to increase by 40 percent wow. in the next 12 months and I'm like wow, wow. it's already wow. in my opinion saturated especially yes. when you know everyone's targeting you know the 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 top five the top 10 markets for multifamily right yeah. now and yeah. just getting more so I've seen a lot of people switching and, and kind of pivoting and, and looking at other things to, to wait. But I do think that these interest rates hiking mm -hmm. are going to identify a lot of inexperienced teams that didn't plan. Yeah, uh, You're going to start seeing some defaults. You're going to start seeing some flat out foreclosures. Um, I think there's going to be some truly distressed managers and distressed buys because of that to where they're just trying to get basically recruit their their losses and and you know try to walk away at a break even um and then just okay that oh wow I messed up and I yeah think yeah and so the, it'll be you know be like shooting fish in a barrel for those of you that have experience you know to pick up more multifamily at lesser costs and and of course that changes the the NOI and the DSCR and it makes it all more profitable for everybody on yeah. the on the long haul yeah I was talking to another um I'll just call him a syndicator. He's been doing it for 20 years, actually. He's been doing it for a really long time. So he's one of the first people started it, but he, you know, he's been doing it. And what he's now doing is syndicating um, 
uh, hotels and syndic syndicating. So it's not just multifamily, he's syndicating hotels, he's sending, syndicating car washes and some other, some other unique properties where, you know, the single one person going in and trying to buy isn't working. And so let's just collaborate and create a pool of, you know, investors so that others can invest in as well. I'm just hoping it doesn't turn into the tranches that we had in the great recession <laughs> where everybody's investing in, in these things, you know, and uh, we know from the big, uh, what was it called? The big something. I think, I can't think of the word from the movie, the big something, um, you know, where there was a, um, a woman who a pole dancer, you know, in a strip club. And she's like, what do you mean my investment properties are going to be right? And, and this goes back all the, all the way to the days of Joe Kennedy, you know, when he says, when the shoe shine guy asks you about his stock, you know, that there's a problem. And so yeah. we wonder if we're going to go into that kind of a, you know, kind of a market. Uh, so, but a very interesting, but thank you for your perspective. I think that's, that's really great to hear. And I love, I love hearing the, the statistics while I'm not happy about them. I love hearing those statistics. So what, um, what do you think someone that's listening to this podcast should be thinking about, you know, as they're saying, how do I diversify my portfolio, you know, knowing that people have, some people have just, you know, regular jobs, they're not entrepreneurs, but they are, you know, maybe entrepreneurial, right? They're commission-based, they have a team, perhaps, you know, um, and perhaps they have 401k. That's pretty traditional, you know, for most loan officers is to have a, a 401k. What would you recommend that, that they consider looking into and doing the research on for their assets? Yeah. So, I mean, I would even look at using that 401k and putting it to work and re re basically not labeling it, but uh, restructuring it to where it's a solo 401k. And then yeah. you can actually use those funds to invest into uh, syndications, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how they're regulated. But, yeah. uh, you know, I would say if you are working a job and you're time poor, but money rich, mm -hmm. I would say find the team, find a co-sponsor team, maybe find a few. Find a few in different industries. Um, first off, I would say sit down and figure out what are your goals from your, your portfolio, from your investment portfolio. What do you want? Is it the cash flow? Is it just an equity multiplier until you're ready to retire? Then you'll convert over into more cash flowing assets. Is it a half a medium? You know, th those are the questions that you got to sit down and really think. And, you know, if you sit down with me as a potential investor, the first thing I'm really going to get into is exactly what you want. Yeah. Not what I want for you, but what yeah. you want for you. I love that. Yeah. And I think having the clarity of knowing what you want, you know, that it's just so habitual to do a 401k. It just is. And a lot of times people leave those 401ks as they job hop or move around. And, you know, we've all seen it. And for those that are listening, they're loan officers. You've seen it on an application, right? People have six and seven different itty bitty 401ks. Well, you'd be better off just to, because you set it and forget it. God knows how long ago into dot coms. <laughs> Remember, and then we had the crowd, and the, they may not even exist, right? Um, and uh, you know, there's so much, so much of a bet. There's, I'm, I'm having a hard time talking. Uh, the strategy of uh, pooling all those together and creating something bigger that grows exponentially in what is popular and effective today for you is so much better than leaving them dormant, you know, at those other places. And I love that you're saying that pulling it into a, a solo 401k, you know, a self-directed 401k, there's a lot of different avenues that you could do with that, um, you know, or into a whole life account. Yeah. No, like I mean, and, and that's a, so it's, it's basically wealth growth and wealth protection. Yeah. Uh, you know, utilizing those 401ks, the IRAs, your whole life insurance, you know, you can protect what's in there and, and really what you're protecting from your, yourself from most is the taxation. Yeah. Um, that's a big thing, but you know, in a lot of commercial real estate, even if you're just making a cash investment, you know, there's tax benefits there still, you know, still they're trying to cut down on a lot of them, but, you know, you still got cost segregation that comes with bonus depreciation and, you know, we can go all in on that. But yeah, I mean, if you're, a, you know, I would just say a, a worker looking to dabble here, dabble there, then I would, I would definitely recommend sitting down with someone that's willing to give you, you know, 30 minutes and just 
picking their brain, you'd be surprised how many different industries and facets within those individual industries. I mean, you say commercial real estate, that's too broad. Oh, it's it's, really like, it's broad. like, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just way too broad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, and, and I don't just dabble in just commercial real estate. I mean, I, I look at the debt side of the things too, and I find funds that I can invest in on debt. Um, especially when interest rates are seeing, you know, 10, 12, 13. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, yeah. So you might be going through, uh, some loan, you know, collaborative loan channels and things like that, where people are trying to, you know, uh, to roll in their debt, you know, and pay off debt and consolidate uh, just regular types of debt, especially with the feds raising rates, right? Our, our credit card debt has gone up. So yeah. And I'm finding that I'm doing some of that, that kind of stuff too. I just invested in a cap fund, you know, that's just playing around with a lot of different things. I shouldn't say playing around because it's not that I would never invest money (laughs) into something that's playing around, but you know, we're investing in some, um, uh, I can see them. Hold on. Mobile home parks, right? We're investing yep. in some mobile home parks. So, um, and those yeah, are right now I'm looking at, I've got about 70 million of my portfolio is multifamily that I am kind of both act more active. And then just one of the co-sponsors I'm looking at uh, guarantoring and, and co-sponsoring a, a hotel, mm-hmm. uh, a mobile home park, self-storage, right. RV, and yep. looking at putting together a fund that is ultimately going to be private equity lending. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to diversify as much as I, I, I can with yeah. with the same strategy, copying and pasting it to a lot of these different industries. So, like you said, you know, you, you can't be in fi- you can't be in 15 different businesses. You don't have enough time No, no. But for implementing the same strategy to overlap to where your dominoes are lined and then you can be above and beyond. And then that's really where you see the growth, but you've got to get your foundation built first so that you have something to build on and then take it from there. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a a great message that you're telling everybody. So um, in the time that we have left, we just have like about five minutes left. I just want to talk about building a team, you know, um, and and this is, this is for loan officers, building a team, realtors, investors who listen into this podcast, you know, for building a team. But it's also building a team as an investor yourself, a team of experts around you. So if we can just think in both of those um, those uh, channels, that would be really good as we're answering this question. Is um, you know you mentioned before that you fired some of your some of your uh, support team, right? Your your board, if you will, or your advisory team, which is is part of it, and then you've also let go some of your actual team. Can you give us in just a few minutes, some lessons you learned, some do's and don'ts of looking at a team and, you know, some don'ts of looking at a team as well, because I know we all get real excited about hiring someone and we figure, well, we'll just find a place for you, or we get to a capacity and we just need somebody. And I know there's some do's and don'ts that are associated with all of that. Yeah. So we've, I don't know how many have heard the expression, hire slow, fire fast. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, whether you're on, you know, whatever side of the table you're on, are you on the active side building a team to to go after, or are you on an investment side, passive side, looking to build a team? You're still building a team. It's still the same (laughs) strategy, and you need to look at everything the same. Who (laughs) am I investing in? What am I investing in? And where is my out? Yeah, you know, and then yeah, you have on both sides of the table, you have supportive staff. And, you know, or known as vendors, you know, that's yeah. your CPAs, your bankers, your attorneys, your, you know, on and on and on insurance brokers, so on to speak. Uh, and then you have your more of your, your co-sponsoring team, you know, who are you partnering with? How I look at that is I like to be the dumbest guy in the room. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really what it is. And because I look at, you know, I don't need to be a subject matter expert. I need to learn how to take advice from that subject matter expert, take advice from this subject matter expert, weigh all of the information, build a plan for that, and then issue out all the orders of, okay, this is what we need to do to move forward, to hit our goal. And then my job is to inspect what I ex- expect. Yeah. So that's a lot of it. Same as an investor. Okay. This is what I want. I'm going to interview with this guy to go on that direction, interview with that interview with that. I'm going to interview someone that he, that has invested in, into that sponsorship team. I want to figure out what their business plans are, what their morals are, what their backings are, ask questions. And at the same time, take time to do your own research. 
Never yeah. take just what they are giving you. Any yeah. deal that I look at, the, I ask for the financials. Yeah. Why? Because dealers don't lie. Give me the financials of the property and give me your performa. And if a sponsorship team won't share a performa, you're out. I'm out. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to underwrite the deal myself and go, okay, how did you get to this number? And if they've got an answer that's you know reasonable, okay, yeah, I can see. I can agree with that. But know how to do your own research. Um, you know, and if you don't want to, and you're that time strapped and, and don't have anything, and you're just wanting to just be hundred percent passive, then you need to at least spend some time getting to know certain sponsors, watch them, understand them. And then, you know, before you make that investment into that, you know, go. And it, I would say where a safer strategy for you is to look at a fund. Yeah. Invest into a fund. It's kind of like, okay, if you don't have time to research stock, what do they advise you to do? Invest into mutual funds. Yeah, Why? it's safer. That fund or an EFT or whatever yeah. will go out and invest. So you're diversifying your risk and relying on a group that is, is making ultimately investing with your money versus you just going out and investing your money directly. Yeah. So, it, I mean, like I said, it, it, got a, it goes back to what you're looking for and where you're at and what situation you are coming from and hoping to get to. Yeah. Um, and to take the time to really know what you're looking for. You know, my, my son um, and daughter-in-law, they have a lot of investments as well. And one of the things they say all the time is trust, but verify. Yes. Trust, but verify, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm liking this person. I'm trusting them, but let me still verify. You can't go, you know, you can't go beyond that. And I think that's the same thing in hiring a team. You know, when you're in an active position, you're trying to hire a team around you is, you know, don't just trust the answer. You know, are you organized? Yes. Okay. Give me an example. Who's going to say Verify. no? <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> I know it. No, I don't know what I'm doing. You right. know, I'm just, I just need money so that I can, I can figure this right, all out. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, I, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. I love it. I love it. So Wes, it's been great. Yeah. Um, talking to you. I was going to say yakking with you because that's sort of yeah. my mom's phrase. Sorry about that. It's been great talking to you, but I, um, I want to know if there's something you want to leave with, uh, for everyone who is, you know, just thinking about our audience here, our audience, what would you want to leave with, um, with them for them to, you know, maybe take some action on or do some thinking about? Yeah, I, I would say figure out what you want to be, figure out what lifestyle you want to live mm. and start realizing that time is the only thing that you can't get back. You yeah. can make back money. Mm -hmm. You can, you can always mm -hmm. learn more. You can, but time is the most sensitive and important thing that you need to, to, to start measuring every decision you make. My two biggest things that I look at for every decision I make, and it, as I drift from it, I have to pull back and do a reset, but it's what is the return on my time? Yeah. And how does it affect everyone involved? Because it needs to be a win-win for everyone involved. Why? Because those that feel like they're getting a short end of the stick, it's only a matter of time before they lose passion, they lose interest, and then now their workload is on your plate too. <laughs> yes. I'm laughing about that because I just had one of my clients, she, she had someone who, uh, one of my coaching clients, her her uh, LOA decided, a loan officer assistant just decided not to show up. Nowhere to be found for days. And I said, well, that's job abandonment. Let him go. And she goes, but I need him. No, let him go. Let him go. You need but the you, position filled, not the person that you had filling. It. Right, right, right. And I said, that's why you, she goes, well, I guess I need to start looking. And I said, oh, no, you didn't just say that because we're always looking. We are talent scouts. We should always have people in our back pocket, you know, so that when that person goes, we can send in that second string right away and let them become that first string and develop them into that. So, you know, I love that you said that. I love that you said that. It made me, it made me laugh about that because that's pretty interesting. Well, again, I just want to say thank you how what is the best way for everyone to reach out to you the best way i've got lots of links for you but what is yeah. the best way honestly the best way is i've reached that friend request limit on my personal page so i, I saw that i liked you by the way <laughs> <laughs> thank you so i put together a page so everyone that is the best way to to keep in contact with me i post events that i am supporting yeah. events that i'm attending events that i am hosting um, you know, I'll drop some free nuggets in there all the time, but then feel free if you want message me through there and, yeah. you know, we can, you know, if there's synergy and, and I feel like, yes, I can help you from what you're looking for. I'll set a meeting. I don't just say yes to everyone just to, right. you know, like I said, 
there's no return on my time or your time if if I can't help you. Yeah. So yeah, I would just and that's a easy at if you just go search Wesley D Yates and you'll find the page. That's me. So I'll be yeah. There. And I want to make sure everybody heard that it's B as in boy. No, no, D is in as in D dog. Is, okay, D is in dog. That's why I'm asking. W D Y. Yeah. Wesley D as in dog Yates. Yeah, yeah, love it. And and again, we have the we have the link. Um, we'll have all those links there for everybody to reach out to you and follow you and just see what you're up to. And maybe, you know, this is the time for you to say, you know, maybe it's not now for me, but if I start following Wesley, maybe I'll get I'll learn some things. Like you said, a few nuggets, right? Maybe I'll learn some things that that are out there in the world that I wasn't aware of. So that's my hope for everyone here today. And again, thank you so much for your service to our country and to helping us have our freedom. We really appreciate that very much. And I just always have to stress that a lot. Um, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your time here with us today. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate you having me on here. Absolutely. Well, everyone, thank you again for joining us today and taking time out of your busy day. And please don't forget to scroll down on your phone and give us a great five-star review and write a little comment about what you learned on this podcast um, with Wes and um, what you've learned on the podcast generally. We love hearing what you have to say and we appreciate that. And then also don't forget, we have a couple of virtual three-day events coming up on Cracking the Code on uh, your leadership and growing your business and scaling your business. So please make sure you're checking out those links and get signed up for those. We'd love to see you at those three-day virtual events for now. And we will talk to you next time on Mortgage Lending Mastery. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Be sure to subscribe to hear more sales tips, ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you with your personal and professional growth to multiply your results in record time. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Wanting more beyond the podcast? Join our Mortgage Lending Mastery membership community where you will find extended interviews with our favorite guests, weekly training, tips, and insider secrets, fireside chats with Jen, free content, meet, share, and collaborate with other members, and so much more. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about this exclusive content. Mortgage Lending Mastery is an industry syndicate charter podcast. Industry Syndicate is the first podcast network specifically for the mortgage and real estate industries. Get the Industry Syndicate app in the App Store or Google Play today.